Hello everyone and welcome to the second half of our two-part video tutorial on how to make a brush-on glove mold. Now in the second half of our tutorial we're going to focus on how to make the actual support shell using the Epoxamite 102 and then we're going to show you how to make a impact resistant casting using the Smoothcast 57D. Now if you haven't seen the mold making part of this video Click on the link above and it's going to take you to the video and show you how to actually make a seamless brush-on glove mold. Now let's go ahead and take a look on how the support shell is made. I have chosen to make the support shell using the epoxy and glass cloth because I will be using the mold for hand roto casting. So the finished shell will be very strong and incredibly lightweight which makes it ideal for handling a mold by hand. We're going to start by trimming away some of the excess uh, uh, flange that we build up off the silicone on our mold. And then we're going to mark the mold exactly in half where we're going to split the support shell. Uh, this should be uh, right in the center so that you don't have any interlocking, uh, any undercuts where the uh, support shell can actually get caught up on. Now, to separate the two halves and build up our support shell, we're going to use Sculptic soft clay to do the uh, separation wall. Uh, this material is really easy to work with, and as you can see, uh, you can um, maneuver it uh, really easily to create very clean surfaces as you want for a support uh, shell wall like this that we're building up. So all the gaps between the silicone mold and the clay buildup should be closed and uh, clean. Now we're going to make some keys using the same uh, Sculptex clay. And we're going to basically press these right against the uh, wall that we build up. And then a little bit of trimming and cleaning up around the keys uh, just to make sure they are also uh, clean and tight and don't have any gaps between them. Now here you can see one more time the uh, exact split down the middle where the support shell is going to be. And here in the back the actual build up off the clay. See that I didn't use a lot of clay to build up that support. Alright now that our clay wall has been built uh, we can use some release agent. This is East Release 200 and we're using a spray brush spray technique. We want to make sure that we cover every surface including the working board that's made out of wood. And if you remember we used some Sonite wax on that board and now we just want to make sure that we use some release agent so that if any epoxy uh, does make it onto that wood surface it will release from it. And then we're going to allow the uh, release agent to dry for about 30 minutes. Now the epoxy that we're going to be using for the support shell is the Epoxamite 100 with the 102 medium hardener. This is a uh, 3 to 1 mix ratio by volume. You can always mix it by weight. Um, but uh, more specifically, this material has a 22 minute work time, so that's why I chose it. Basically, you have 22 minutes uh, to work the material from the combining of the A and B. Now, besides the laminating epoxy, we're also going to need some uh, glass fiber cloth. And to be more specific, this is a 9.6 ounces per square yard. Uh, glass cloth. These come in different weights and usually the lighter they are, the easier they are to uh, manage and to handle. The heavier they are, the more difficult they are to apply and handle in uh, applications. Um, this one is kind of a middle of the road. It's easy to maneuver in small sections and because of that we're going to go ahead and cut the uh, glass cloth in several smaller pieces. Uh, that we're going to be applying to the uh, support shell as we're building it up. So it's really good uh, to have several different sizes already pre-cut. Uh, that way you don't have to uh, work around this and cut smaller pieces while you're actually applying the resin. So I'm going to go ahead and cut these to size and then we can move on to dispensing the epoxamite. Keep in mind that uh, when using glass cloth, it's always better to cut smaller pieces and overlap them, which creates a much uh, stronger support shell uh, once it's uh, cured. So the epoxamite laminating resin can be either dispensed by volume or by weight. And here we're going to use an accurate gram scale. Uh, the mix ratio is 100 to 29. 
So we're going to dispense 100 grams of the part A, and then we're going to dispense 29 grams of the part B. Now we're going to combine those two and mix them thoroughly in a clean mixing container. And always scrape the sides and scrape the bottom off the mixing container to incorporate those two products thoroughly. Now another important thing is to use a one-to-one -one, uh, ratio of the epoxy to the glass cloth. So if we're using uh, here 122.5 grams of the epoxy, we should use the same amount of the glass cloth. This is going to make our support shell super strong yet lightweight and we won't be wasting any of the resin. Keep in mind that any extra resin that you're applying is unnecessary weight added and is not going to make your shell actually stronger. Now once the material is mixed we can start by applying a layer of it uh, to the entire surface. I'm going to uh, go ahead and do that before we start putting any of the cloth down. Now you want to make sure that you apply the uh, epoxy uh, everywhere in all the corners and now we can go ahead and put the cloth over that. We're going to basically push the epoxy through the cloth. Uh, the epoxy is already there and the cloth just needs to be saturated with it. So we're pushing uh, that cloth down and squeezing the epoxy through it. Now go ahead and repeat this procedure all around the uh, mold surface and here you can see how many little pieces I'm using around those keys and around the 90 degree folds and uh, really what that does it allows me to fold the glass cloth uh, and manipulate it in areas that I want to and uh, secondly it also adds to the strength of, a, uh, of the overall structure because of the small pieces overlapping so many times now once this is applied we're going to give it about two hours of partial cure time and for the next layer I'm going to be adding a little bit of the so strong red to the epoxy uh, the reason for that is that we can clearly see where we're applying the epoxy and the cloth and once again here you can see that I'm applying small pieces of glass cloth, they're overlapping each other and they're being pressed and squeezed into 90 degree turns and over the keys and because they're so small it allows us to manipulate the cloth in that uh, manner. And once again the uh, material is allowed a partial cure for about two hours before moving on to the next layer. And uh, here I'm going to quickly just run through this. This is the third and the fourth layer. Uh, the obvious thing is that we're changing colors as we're changing layers. Again, so we can easily see where we're applying material and a cloth to. Now once uh, the fourth layer is finished, we can allow this a full cure for at least 15 hours before moving on to the next step. After a full cure, we can uh, start by removing the clay wall that we built up earlier. And here you can see I'm using a wooden sculpting tool. Uh, that way we don't uh, accidentally cut or puncture the actual mold that we made. And once all the clay is cleaned up, I'm going to go around with a pair of scissors and remove some of those high points of the glass that we build up. Uh, these are quite sharp, so you want to avoid cutting your hands on it. Now we can apply some release agent to the first half of our support shell and here I'm using the Ease Release 205 with uh, the very specific reason I want to make sure that I'm applying the release agent to a specific area and using the liquid versus an aerosol can uh, helps me to uh, literally put the release agent where I want it to go without the aerosol pushing it around and here you can see that I'm putting it over the edge in case that uh, some of the epoxy is going to make it over that edge it's not going to stick to the uh, first half of the support shell and then I'm going to also put some of that release agent onto the working surface onto the wood board so that the epoxy doesn't stick to that either. The release agent is now allowed 30 minutes to dry before moving on to the next step. Now that the release agent has dried, we can uh, move on to applying the epoxy and the glass cloth to the second half of our support shell. And basically we're going to follow the same steps that we did for the first half. We're going to apply four layers of the cloth 
Um, and then we're going to allow the entire support shell to fully cure for at least 16 hours before demolding. Now, the demolding process starts with sanding down of the uh, separation uh, of the two halves. So we're going to sand that down, and we're going to proceed to sand the entire surface off the support shell. This is uh, really important if uh, there's any kind of glass uh, cloth bits that are sticking out. Those are going to be very sharp. So to avoid any kind of injury, always sand down these shells all the way around. And then uh, the perimeter of the uh, support shell is trimmed. And then using a, a spatula, we can uh, pry that mold off. We want to break the seal and then peel the mold off of the actual working surface. Next step is to remove the clay buildup that we did uh, for the model, remove the shell pieces, and then we're going to add a little bit of the talc powder or baby powder to the silicone. This makes it a lot easier for the silicone to uh, glide or slide over itself. It removes some of that silicone friction uh, that's usually present uh, when silicone slides over other silicone products. Now, a little bit of maneuvering, and we're going to peel that mold away to uh, reveal the actual model that we used for this project. So now that the entire mold has been uh, cleaned and taken apart, we can put it back together, and you can here clearly see how nicely those keys are holding the entire mold in the support shell. And the support shell uh, has its own keys, and now we're going to bolt it all together. And you can see here how lightweight that mold is. This is really an important part of this project. We want to create a lightweight mold that we can handle easily with our hands uh, when doing uh, rotocast projects or holocast projects. Now, for the casting of the project, we're using the SmoothCast 57D for several reasons. Uh, first of all, it's impact resistant. It's a one-to-one -one mix ratio by volume, and it's a translucent-ish color, so we can easily pigment the material uh, to a specific color that we want. Now, before you start dispensing, it's really important that you actually pre-mix these materials, so shake them well, and then we're going to use a marker to mark our dispensing cups. And here you can see the actual color of the 57D. It's kind of a milky, translucent white, which is very easy to pigment using some, uh, in this case, so strong black added to the part B and then is mixed in thoroughly uh, to combine the pigment with the part B before mixing with the part A. Now we waited to dispense the part A because it is uh, sensitive to atmospheric moisture. So once we dispense the part A, we can uh, combine it in a mixing container with the part B, mix the entire uh, mixture thoroughly by scraping the sides, scraping the bottom. I can't stress this enough. And then we can proceed to pour it into our mold. So some of the important features and techniques of rotocasting hollow helmets like this is the fact that you can see into the mold. As you can see here, I'm clearly able to see where my material is applied. And that's the other key. You want to make sure that you get a layer of the uh, resin inside your mold on all the surfaces. So we capture the detail. And then you can see that I'm continuously watching, making sure that there's not too much resin. Everything is covered. And then we're going to continue to spin the mold in a 360-degree pattern. But you can see how I'm spinning that mold. And imagine if that mold was 20 pounds. It's going to be impossible to do this. So keeping the support shells lightweight is the key to a successful hand rotocasting mold. Now, once you uh, cover the inside off your mold, we're going to allow this material partial cure for about 10 minutes before adding layer 2, 3, and 4. After the first layer has partially cured, we're going to add subsequent layers uh, to build up a total thickness of about a quarter to three-eighths of an inch. Um, the same way we did the first layer, we're going to repeat the technique that we used by uh, spin casting or rotating the mold in a 360 degree pattern and then allowing a partial cure in between each layer until we build up the ultimate thickness we're aiming for.
Now, once you have the final layer uh, solidified, we can allow this to fully cure for at least 30 minutes, but I usually like to give it about an hour or two before actually demolding the piece. The reason why I allow it a longer cure time than uh, what the technical bulletin recommends, this product is mass sensitive. So the more product you have built up, the faster it's going to cure, the more heat it generates while it's curing. The thinner the cross section is that you're built up, the slower it usually cures. After our casting has fully cured, we can go ahead and remove the support shell from the mold in order to remove our casting. As you can see here, the two halves off the support shell come apart very easy. We're going to use the same technique to demold it. A little bit of talc or baby powder is going to make the uh, silicone slide a lot easier over itself. And then with some pulling and tugging, we're going to release the uh, casting out of that mold. It's really nice to have a uh, glove mold like this because you don't have any seam lines on the actual casting that you have to worry about uh, touching up. Uh, the only uh, finishing work uh, as far as the casting here is to basically trim the opening where we poured this, uh, the smooth cast in from. So there's going to be a little bit of material spill there. Here you can see that the uh, 5070D is really impact resistant. It uh, has some give to it. You can bang it against the table. It will be just fine. To finish our project here with the helmet, uh, we're going to proceed to cut the uh, eyes out and some of the vents on top of the helmet and for the mouthpiece. And then we're going to mask the entire helmet um, to be painted. And we're going to go ahead and paint it using any acrylic paints pretty much. Now, once that is all uh, dried up, we can go ahead and uh, remove the masking tape and the uh, project is pretty much ready to be worn. We uh, made the casting, here's our helmet. We want to do a quick impact test to see how well it does uh, if it's, uh, let's say, uh, thrown off a building. How about that? So here we go. Now that right there is about a 30 foot drop. And to tell you the truth, I uh, did not expect the helmet to survive. But after we picked it up and inspected it closely, you can clearly see here that the only damage to the actual helmet is the paint peeling off uh, from the impact. So there's no cracks, there's no breakage in the actual piece that we made. This is really exciting and uh, makes a really great product for impact resistant projects that you have. Now, if you got inspired by this project and you'd like to uh, make some of your own, you can purchase any of our products by visiting any one of our distributors around the world. Simple and easy way to make a brush-on glove mold using the Rebound 25 and a super lightweight uh, support shell using the epoxamite uh, laminating system. Now, if you have an idea about what we should do next, please let me know in the comments below. And if you like this video, please hit the thumbs up button. Now, remember to keep up with our latest mold making and casting videos. Remember to subscribe.